Welcome to the Real Advisor podcast, T-R-A-P, TRAP. Please follow us and join in the conversation on Twitter at Advisor Podcast, where you can suggest ideas and themes you'd like the TRAP team to discuss. Also remember to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and leave a six out of five star review on iTunes. Doing all this really, really helps us, which means we can do more to help you. Now let's head over to the studio for the latest pile of trap. Yes, indeed, dear Trappist. Welcome back to what many people are calling episode 55 of the Real Advisor podcast, T-R-A-P, Trap. My name is Lick Ninken. Joining me as ever in the digital studio of Doom are the three other horsemen of the apocalypse. And the ultra heart, Carl Delabocci. Widger and Alan the Storyteller Smith. Now, gentlemen, we have a show packed full of absolutely nothing. So let's start unpacking it straight away with some more high energy review reads read out by my very good friend, the right on rogue, Mr. Andrew Hart. Thank you very much, Nicholas. The first review is from Hamish Munro, entitled Fantastic Five Stars. As a relatively new entrant and second careerist, the podcast is invaluable. Plenty, plenty of takeaways from every episode and plenty of cutting through the proverbial rubbish this profession gets embroiled in. Decades of stories, ups, downs, jingles and close personal friends make it an engaging listen. Final review uh, is entitled Just What Our Profession Needs, five stars. As a seasoned financial advisor, I have to say the Real Advisor podcast is a gem. Having only listened to a couple of episodes, I was quick to share this with all our team of younger advisors and encourage them to listen on a regular basis. The topics are relevant, the messaging is spot on, and just what our profession needs. Highly recommended, Mike Mullen-Hughes. Back to you, Nick. Can I just say one... Wow, lovely. Can I just say lovely. one quick thing? Sure. Yeah. Mm. Which is, um, you know, we really, really appreciate these reviews. These are the reviews which go up on, what, Apple Podcasts? Apple, yeah, mainly. Yeah, we... Uh, and, and as you know, because we all share them amongst ourselves, we also get, like, private messages, DMs and stuff on LinkedIn um, that are fantastic mm. as well. And I encourage anyone mm. who's just thinking of sending us a private message, could you please just post it on the Apple Podcast platform? Because it, it helps with our reach and it helps the podcast in general. So I just thought I'd say and that. Just to, reiter- just, to, just to reiterate the Apple thing, if you don't have an Apple iPhone, uh, you know your partner might, your children might. So just get onto the Apple podcast app platform and leave a review. It'd be great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Really. We're getting loads of nice things said about us at the minute. Um, I'm sure it'll revert to the mean at some stage, but it's a, it, it does give all four of us a shot in the arm. Okay. So episode 55, somehow we've made it through uh, 54 episodes to, to date and we're on to 55 and let's give 55 a timestamp with some topical Tidbits, what's going on in this great thing of ours? Uh, Smithy, you're starting off. I saw a uh, an update of a recent report um, created by Morningstar, um, and it's called, uh, you know, Mind the Gap. This, this, is, an up- this is something they produce quite regularly, um, and, and it, it's... Um, what it does is it, it, it analyzes in quite some detail the actual investment returns received. It's a bit different to the Dalbar one, which is a different one, which we can talk about separately. But this is one that tracks money flows in and out of mutual funds. Uh, it is in the US, but same rules would apply in the UK, Ireland and around the world, I'm sure. Um, and what they indicate, and it's a, it's a number of different factors that arrive at it, but effectively they say most retail investors uh, underperform the, not the market, but the funds that they invest in by about 15%. And why that is, is because people will move into funds often after they have experienced uh, an uptick in their performance. <laughs> and they'll move out if there's a temporary decline. So there's quite a lot of, of movement across different funds. So say you chose a particular fund. And it, and it, you know, it showed you there on their marketing materials, it showed they'd done 12% a year or something. Most investors, and it doesn't really um, determine whether they're advised or non-advised, but a lot of investors will trail those returns simply due, due to market timing. And what it says is those that are likely to actually receive the returns that the fund itself creates are those that tend to stick with the fund. Uh, and so therefore, it's another positive uh, for those who effectively buy and buy and hold 
build your Rolls Royce engine, build your investment structure, investment portfolio, sure, rebalance and do all those things, but don't be chopping and changing and moving from one fund to the other simply because maybe there's a period of underperformance or there's been some super, super performance and you're trying to sort of trim your your winnings, as, as they sometimes say. So uh, and the other thing, sometimes these reports do get come in for some criticism from <laughs> the usual suspects. We all know who they are. I would say Morningstar as a as a research house really are one of the best. They've got careful, some very, careful. Yeah. They've got some, uh, to me anyway, I've read a lot of the stuff you that comes out of Morningstar are. based in Chicago. Um, and they... They just seem to be very robust with their research and with the analysis of markets. And so we've, I posted a link to this report. It is helpful to those who are advising clients. Carl, did you have a point? Yeah, just um, so you mentioned the Dalbar study, which is kind of similar, as you say. But uh, the, 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 my favorite study on this topic was Fidelity did a study many years ago at this stage. And I think it's kind of infamous now at this stage in, within the financial planning profession. So they did a study on who the most successful investors were. So the, the most successful investors were those that were dead. Yeah, so that's right. You, you, can't, yeah. you, you can't obviously do anything to your portfolio if you've passed away. And, and the second most yeah. successful bunch of investors were those who forgot about yeah, their investment forgot. plans, who forgot that they existed. And then by a distant third was everybody else. So look, um, people can say what they want about these studies. If you just give, no matter, this isn't about active or passive or what, you know, what fund you're in. No, if yeah, you just yeah. leave, and I think that's the point about the morning star, isn't it? That it's like you actually got 15% less than, than you, the fund returned. It's just leave the bloody thing alone in the long term. And the market has a, ha has a habit of doing its thing. So, well, it uh, does, yeah, but it but good, it underpins. Good shout out there, Alan. Yeah, I have to say before we get bombarded with various people, that dead persons survey is is questionable. I think no one's been able to actually find the original source, as far as I can see. But it is talked about quite a lot. But there's no question. Yeah. There is yeah. no question that you know holding for the long term. But as I say, I think this is a bit more subtle than people just moving out and moving to cash. This is. You know, they're still in the funds, they're still largely invested, but they're kind of chopping and changing. They're waiting for returns to have a three year performance track record or something before they buy them. Uh, and similarly, so it's slightly more nuanced. And it does challenge the kind of, if you like, the discretionary portfolio managers, that kind of approach, which does exactly that. It sort of tries to identify the good funds, God knows what it's based upon, past performance, and it moves the funds around. That is their kind of value proposition. We'll chop and change, we'll buy and sell, depending on our view of future markets. So it, it questions that as a basic strategy. Lick Ninken. Yes, thank you, Storyteller. And um, for those of you watching on YouTube, and if you happen to be an employee of Riverside, you've got this fantastic high-tech platform we use to record the podcast. But if one of us wants to speak, we actually have to hold up our fingers physically like a cretin to wait our turn. <laughs> there surely must be like a, a reaction button the same way the Zoom has, where you can just say, listen, I want to go next. Anyway, that's by the by. I think the classic example of what you've just mentioned there, Alan, is the uh, is the Cathie Wood Arc Fund, which... which, um, which had that just amazing performance. It really was amazing. Uh, but there, there, there are other charts showing fund inflows going in just as the performance craters off a cliff. You know, people chasing past performance. People who, who went from what, probably the vast amount of money going to Cathy Woods Fund was from other funds, people selling out of funds, looking at the performance and thinking, I want some of that going into it at just the wrong time, of course. And they'll probably, when we see the next iteration of those graphs, you'll see all the outflows will be right at the bottom of her, of her um, plummet. So it's uh, yeah, human beings, eh? It's uh, it's it's never, never going to be resolved. Thank thank goodness for us. Okay, I think we can go on to the next topic, and that is that is ultra. Okay, so this one is from Tax Policy Associates. It sounds dreadfully boring. This is a real deep dive about thirty-two ways Rachel Reeve could raise uh, this twenty-two billion that she's talking about. Uh, if you're into sort of uh, deep dive information all about tax, then I recommend you check it out. Um, it lays out all the current taxes and what they're bringing in in terms of revenue in the UK and then her possible proposals that she can um, implement. Uh, there's a guy on Twitter, Dan Needle. Is you guys follow him? He's very, very outspoken yeah. about yeah, tax yeah, stuff. Yeah, he's, good. he's got some good information. 
Um, so yeah, it's worth checking out what they've just put out in relation to this. He's got 169,000 followers on on X, um, so he knows his stuff. Um, yeah, that's it really. Uh, yeah, check out the links and uh, yeah, just on just on that tax. subject on the other award-winning podcast known as the Bulletproof Entrepreneur. La, <laughs> la, a few days ago, I spoke with. Nimesh Shah, who's the CEO of Blick Rothenberg, um, he was one of the, the top tax advisors in the country. And he said, he said lots of interesting things, I think, a lot relevant to advisors. Um, 22 billion is such, a, it's such an irrelevant sum in relation to the 800 billion that's raised every year, heading towards a trillion pounds, which is collected from taxpayers in the UK. It's a very, very small rounding error. And um, yeah, it's quite interesting. Well, a lot of things he says. So, so do check it out. Good conversation. That's it. It's not. It's not the. Uh, it's not the tax. It's not the money coming in that's the problem. They've never had so much money coming in. It's the fact they can't stop the money going out. Mm -hmm. That doesn't seem to be ever on the table um, until we go broke. Um, and I'd say this budget is is of all the budgets I've known in my time being an advisor, this is the one that's hanging the most over. The most over. So I just want the bloody thing over and done with, so we can move on yeah. and work out how the land's going to lie. There's so much conjecture. People are, people are, I've, yeah, people are more nervous, I think, now than they have been for a long time with this budget. But it'll be what it will be. Um, and Carl, later on in the topical tip, you're going to tell us about your, well, do you want to do it now, Carl? Is that a natural segue into your, your, your appearance? Well, I'm not ready, Nick, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so we had our budget. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> you're never ready. <laughs> <laughs> We, I wasn't ready for the radio interview either, but anyway, um, yeah, so I was on the, the Pat Kenny show talking about the kind of financial planning pensions implications from the budget. So we had the greatest ever Irish giveaway budget, and um, it won't be surprising to lots of people uh, that there's an election due here Elections. very shortly. Uh, however, however, to be fair, uh, there was some long term uh, stuff in the budget, which, to be fair, the government should be commended for that. Um, so the the increase in the thresholds and the pensions was uh, basically they put out a, a, a document on that prior to the budget. So that wasn't really in the budget. Um, they introduced uh, a, a, an increase of. 65,000 euros on the income uh, or on the inheritance tax thresholds, which is to be welcome. So now parent to child, it's about four. It's not about, it is 400 grand. Uh, PRSAs have remained unchanged, which is the pension product we can put uh, it via company as much as you want in for um, an employee, which is to be welcomed. It was chat that that might, nice. might have been changed. Unfortunately, no change in the exit tax, which... We will be discussing that. That's that's important for the the meat and potatoes discussion we're going to have later on. Um, and then they brought in this uh, mansions tax, which means the stamp duty for properties over one and a half million is going from two percent to. I'm sorry 6%. to hear about that, Carl. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> see, whoa, actually, whoa, we... Carl, going going from what going from two to six. Yeah, but it's only on the amount over and above 1.5. Oh, okay. okay. It's graduation. And okay. uh, so it's not actually going to have the impact that people, and it's definitely a kind of, a, I don't know, it's, you know, let's get the fat cats kind of thing, you know, and mm. uh, um, it's not going to have much of an impact, albeit people are saying it is, but it's, it's actually not really in my view. Like if you, on a 2 million property, it's an extra 20 grand. You're not making a decision on buying a two million property on twenty grand. That's that's what I think. So um, I don't know. It all adds up though. It's half the tax <clears> money and twenty grand a year. Mm. I mean, well, that might be your experience. No, it's Cole, not. You know, but other people might feel differently. It's not twenty grand a year. It's twenty grand once off. Um, when, you, when you when you pay, when yeah. you buy it, or when you sell it. Yeah. When you buy it, when you buy it, I thought it, it was okay. an ongoing. It's an extra thing. kind of stamp no, no, type no, thing. No, 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 that's a wealth tax. That's 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 yeah. That's that's mm. the, that's, that's, that's it's a wealth tax that that's going to have very little impact on anybody. It's mm. going to bring in very very little. It's a total and utterly political. It's, sig uh, it's, it's signalling. It's signalling yeah, politics. Signaling. You're, you're signaling. throwing red yeah, meat to your. You're by, throwing by red the way, meat to that section of your party. Yeah, um, I I, uh, I listened to. I think we all did. I listened to your interview. Um, Carl, very good. I thought it was very good. I'm still astounded by the fact that you guys have got this effectively withdrawal tax or whatever you call it, uh, but it applies even if you don't take money out of your investment. So it applies to everyone. Like like we like capital gains tax we've got in the UK 
But even if you just invest for it's the long like term, a, yeah. you're still getting hit by... And leave it alone, yeah. It's like, it's you like just, a, le- just leave it long like term. term. What is tax, it? Yeah. 30-something percent or something? What, it just seems... No, it's not. What, what is it? CGT Tell is 33. Exit tax is 41. And you must pay it on the gain in your investment after eight years, even if you do not withdraw the money. It's 41% yeah, of the gain you've stupid. made. So nearly half the amount yeah. you've made, even though you haven't touched it. That seems yes, yes, incredible. Yeah, yeah. and, so and I know we're two my, screams in, but that's unbelievable. Yeah, yeah but, but, but and my argument is, you know, that that's so. If you go buy a bunch of individual shares, you're paying thirty three percent, and you only have to pay it when you take it out. And CGT dies with you. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, what they're encouraging people to do is to do investing all wrong. However, they're not actually encouraging anybody to do anything because people are just, you know. They're, they're just staying away from it, which is a topic we're going to discuss yeah. in more detail later on. Mm, okay. Um, okay. It wow. is. It, they have said it is on the agenda. Um, so um, to be fair to, I'm apolitical, as you know, right? But th- this government have, d- they've done all the buying of votes through the, the great giveaway, right? We had a 20, we have a 25 billion surplus this year. And that's just politics, I guess. But they have done some longer term things. So I would have always said that budgets are introducing three and four year stuff at, at best, sometimes one and two year stuff. But but this government have actually done some longer term thinking. And I hope then that the longer term thinking is extended if uh, they do get into government next year. Um, you know, what, 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 what they might look at is reducing this exit tax. And actually, when you do the numbers, you don't need the 41 to match the 33. You just need it to come some of the way there. Uh, for it to make a significant difference. How does it work, Carl? Let's say I put an investment now, eight years later, it's a hundred K, hundred thousand euro gain. How do then they take that money? Have I got to sell the funds and do it or the platform does it automatically or how does it work? So if you're on a platform, you have to do it yourself. Uh, so you'll get kind of tax packs from the platform to tell you exactly how much you owe. So if you're doing it on an insured basis, so via an insurance company, the insurance company pays the tax. It just gets deducted and it's paid directly to the revenue. Oh, so it's easier so, that way. So are you, are you at Metis doing this all the time with clients or quite regularly? Like, Well, yeah. So obviously we, we've most of the business, most of our business is actually on a platform. So yes. we have to be, you know, the, these are items for discussion every year at our planning meetings. But you so, have to sell the, the funds quite down to, make, to meet the tax. Miss it. You've got to meet the tax liability. Where are you going to get the money no. from? You've got to sell the funds. Yeah. Well, you have to sell the funds. That's what you. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what people Whoa. do. Right. Well, that's so. a, yeah, different, different to here. That's for sure. I hope, hope Rachel yeah. Reeves is not listening to this particular episode <laughs> yeah. of the Buy Podcast. Um, she usually okay. does. Mo- she moving on, she misses and this. One. this <laughs> um, this um, yeah, the meat and potatoes. This 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 next topical tip bit is kind of again tied to that, and just the lack of the sort of apathy of of, of UK oh. investors, um, oh, and they're. Yeah, sorry, Nick. Go on. No, no, you started now, so you go on, crack on. You started so you can finish. Interesting sound you made there. <laughs> yeah, what are you doing? Um, where, are you, where are your hands? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've heard that somewhere before. <laughs> <laughs> Come right, on, can we, get, can we get back onto the serious topic of lices? Okay, lices <laughs> are a form of ISA, and you can only take them out when you're under 40. <sighs> anyway, in the Times this week, they came out with their data. So we're missing my point. I know, it's my, it my point next. <laughs> yeah, I know. Oh, was What's it? What's happening? Yes. Jesus. That's what I thought you were, in- I thought oh, you were God, talking sorry, over my mate. point. Sorry, no, it's all right, sorry. Fella. It's all right, it's all right, it's all right. Um, so Absolute I'm going to quick anyway. But the meat of potatoes is about, is about how our UK and uh, public, Joe Public, are so dis- disassociated from the stock market and investing <clears> and just don't really want to take any interest in their financial future. And there's an article about these bloody, remember child trust funds, another dreadful invention plonked on the British public by Gordon Brown in 2005. Uh, they're always stuck in my craw because if your baby was born 1st of September 2002 onwards, the government would give you a bung or would give your child a bung of 250 quid. My son was born in that year, but before the 1st of September. So capricious policy. He didn't get a bung from the government. Anyway, these child CTFs were brought in 2005. They were scrapped in 2011. Another disastrous waste of our money. Um, but there are, there's, there's loads and loads of money, over a billion pounds in unclaimed children child trust funds in the UK because people have just obviously just 
forgotten about them, have taken no interest. I imagine most of that money is sitting in cash. Like an ICU, you could put the money into investments if you wanted to. Um, and there are 667,000 unclaimed CTF funds in the UK. Just somewhere, there's a policy document, there's, a, there's an email address that's been changed, there's a password been forgotten, and people just don't have any interest in, in just look, looking after their financial affairs. And it's just endemic, I think, of the malaise of the UK uh, in, investment the UK population's investment approach. Uh, Storyteller, your digit was raised, I think. It was. Um, this reminds me. It reminds me of a um, a, a quick story. I went um, many, many years ago <clears throat> when these things first came out. <clears throat> I went. Um... Grab he's, yourself he's a drink. He's gone. A very long drink. Hope it's it story out. time <laughs> with Alan Smith. <sighs> Mm. I did think it was a while since we had that drop, so I managed to shoehorn. Yeah. You just and reminded me. Thanks for the, <clears> subtle, <throat> the subtle hint. Yeah, I, yeah, I know. <laughs> come on, come on. I've got a story. Um, it is a brief <laughs> story. But I've just, it, funnily enough, you I didn't know you were going to mention that today, and I've been thinking about that over the weekend when I was posting something about what will become the meat and potatoes later on. Exactly that. These child trust funds. So in when did they come out? When, was, when did they first get... Launched again. They, they were introduced in 2005 for children born yeah. 1st of September 2002 onwards. Right. So I, so these, these they were out for a couple of years. And I remember I went to see some new clients. And these were, so I went to their house, nice big house up in Hampstead or somewhere like that. Um, pretty well-to-do professionals. And I, I, they were telling me how old their children were. So I thought, oh, that means they'll have qualified that both of their children would have qualified for these child trust fund things. So I mentioned it to them. I said, so did, did you get, because if you, 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 well, you, you won't know Nick because uh, Luke missed out or you missed out on behalf yeah. of him, but you actually got, it wasn't, it was yeah. what happened was because my kids, at least one of them qualified and we got a, you get a certificate in the post. You get literally a piece of paper. That's what happened at the time in the post. Oh, and God. you were expected then to go to, there was a list of approved providers and you had to go and then, open an account and it could have been a cash version or it could have been a stocks and shares version. So kind of like ISIS. But but the point was there was so much friction because you got this letter in the post and then you got the certificate and you had to get out and find a provider and blah, Ridiculous. blah, blah. So anyway, I went to see these people. I remember sitting in their kitchen chatting through all the, all sorts of different things. I said, oh, and child trust fund, what did you do with it? Did you did you open an account? And they went, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. And they went through, and then the um, <laughs> missus, the wife, went over to, you know, in every kitchen, most people have got these drawers full of bloody screwdrivers and bit, bits and pieces and paperwork yeah, that you never look at. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> yeah. absolutely. So she, <laughs> everyone's got one, uh, and as this couple did as well. And so they, she went rifling through this drawer full of all sorts of stuff and junk mail and pizza you know delivery notifications, all sorts of things. She goes, oh, hang on a minute. I remember getting this ages ago. Tape measures. She, she yeah, also, she brings it out. Yeah. She fishes through it, opens it, and there enough, sure enough, <laughs> there was this child trust fund voucher which she oh. never opened. So and I said, oh, you should have opened an account. And I think I think they managed to do it. The point of this was there was, and this was a you know serious professional couple. You know, they were sensible people, and they have just so disengaged with it. It was another piece of friction in their busy lives, and no one had the time or the energy to do this, and so. It's you, your point is well made, and to the, to think there's still a billion pounds of unclaimed amounts, complete waste of so many people's time, and it's one of the issues. Well, think is, of that two hundred and fifty. That, 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 that yeah, that two hundred and fifty pounds certificate. Think how many hands that had to get through to get to yeah. the, to the recipient. You know, the civil servants that devised the thing. Yeah, the yeah. whole bureaucracy. You know, sending it out in the mail. I mean, it's just like I know. Well, so this, this, this is the, this... for an additional two fifty. Yeah, yeah, they did. Yeah. Some did. Um, but this was the uh, this is the thing. If you're going to get the general public to engage, certainly at this kind of low level entry, you know, 250 quid to open the account, it has got to be frictionless. They've got to default just open the account, just get a government created account start in the first place, and then you've got to, you know, the idea you had to opt out. If you don't want it, then you've got to, you know, have a bit of friction to opt out, like they have for auto enrollment for pensions. That's the strategy. Not yeah, sending exactly, pieces yeah. of paper in the post and hoping someone's going to take a load of action. <laughs> anyway, that was it. Good point, Nick. Thank you very we, much. We just the, the, uh, yeah. the, the budget here just introduced um the they're giving a double whammy on the children's allowance in November and December this year. 
And they're also paying a lump sum of, I think, 420 quid if you have a child born sometime soon. So it's like, <laughs> talk about buying votes. It's like, we're going to have an election. We do, we're not sure when. It'll probably be November, Ooh, just geez. when the first double whammy of the children's allowance is coming in. And we're going to cover this off by calling it a cost of living allowance. So, um, yeah. They, they, so, don't, anyway, they, put, they put, don't know what to do with the money in Ireland now. They've got yeah, no, we're literally in. just like a slice. <laughs> thank you, <laughs> Apple. You thank you, Google. <laughs> thank you, Meta. But, uh, but I suppose the point is it's somewhere in between where that just lands money into people's accounts. And what you're talking about is, you know, you had to go and invest it or whatever. So the solution is somewhere in between the two, the two scenarios, I guess. But uh, just cool. interesting, yeah. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for the um, for the, the thoughts on that. And just just there's, there's the, everything we're talking about here, Trappist. There's a link to it in the Google Doc, which is our master document with all the episode links, which is in the uh, the show notes. Um, all... Now, Ultra, you can now go with your story. Oh, yeah. Sorry for chipping in, Nick. Yeah, so this is uh, information came out by the uh, Times, Sunday Times, uh, this week. Um, 75 million has been paid in penalty charges, people withdrawing money out of their lices before the required time. You can only set up a lysa under the age of 40, and the money needs to be used to buy a property because it's to help you buy a house. Uh, if you don't use the money, you can access it, I think, post age 60. And there's some win and wacky rules. So quite encouraging, though. What What's happened is this year's uh, uh, this ta- last tax year, 75 million was paid. The previous year was 54 million. The previous year was 33 million. What I mean is the amount that's being paid as a penalty is increasing, which means, um, you know, lots of people have, have taken out these products. Um, and it's not the end of the world. I've, I've, I worked it out roughly. If you put 100 quid into a, to a LISA, it needs to go up. Uh, and they give you 25 uh, as a bonus, like 125 quid goes in. If you get about a 6% return, then you get a 25% hit, you end up in the same place. So it's not the end of the world. It's a relatively minor point, but um, it looks like a lot of people have uh, taken out these products uh, and the penalties are getting uh, more and more, but uh, no, no, nothing too exciting. Any questions? They suspended it during COVID. No, I, the, I'm trying to work penalties. out whether, whether, whether people are taking money out for, for out of ignorance or they just need the money. You know, some people won't even realize that they're, you know, they're going to pay, they're going to pay tax. They just need the money. I don't quite yeah. know what they, I mean, just to give you some context, I set one up with a hundred quid before I was 40, just to get, get, get it, you know, get it over the line as it were. My hundred quid turned into 125. It's invested obviously correctly. Now it's got 150 quid in it. Um, so I've just got it there if I want to if I want to use it. But anyway, that's that's absolutely fascinating. Thank you for that nugget. Thank you. Okay, no worries, um, mate. Can we, can keep we it going. Keep on. it going. It's a cracker. We... <laughs> Watch. Stop laughing. Start talking. <laughs> <laughs> What's this one? No, I'm all over the place. What was this? Um... <laughs> Kathleen Gallagher. Oh yeah. So uh, there's a lady called <laughs> there's a lady called Kathleen Gallagher is kind of writing about um, markets and funds in the Business Post. And it's, and it's uh, kind of a, a new thing that they're doing in the Business Post. It's really, really good. And she did uh, an article uh, basically calling out the various wealth managers and what they're comparing their various portfolios to. And then basically that they're picking particular dates to compare their portfolios to whatever benchmark they've decided is the best one. So look, it's uh, she is doing like general market stuff as well, which... Um, I would think is less helpful, but she has written some really decent articles and I would, I would encourage everybody because this is the kind of stuff that we need in the, in the mainstream media, which is basically, you know, calling out some of the questionable practice, shall we say, in terms of, you know, how funds are, you know, it's not morning star, star stuff. It's, it's deciding themselves what their benchmark is and what time frames they're going to compare themselves <laughs> yeah. and all this kind of stuff. Criminal. So it was just, it was, yeah, but it was it was it's really good that um, it's in the mainstream media. Business Post is yeah, it's there's some really good stuff in there. So it's you have to subscribe. But I would encourage anybody who's in, interested in in business and investing to get your subscription going. But fair play and well done to Kathleen Gallagher. I would say good good. Well, I'm going to read that. That's that, that's interesting. Thank you very much, Della Voce. Okay, storyteller, uh, close personal friend of the show keith button um what is he doing yeah close personal friend legendary financial planner keith button who together with his son josh 
runs an excellent financial planning company called Boost, with I think double T, double O, double T. Um, but Keith got in touch double with o. me recently to say that he's launching a free complimentary series, masterclass series. He did this in 2020 to great success, and he, so he's he's going doing it again. Um, really well for everyone really but particularly focused at relatively early stage financial planners um he's running it on saturday mornings um on the basis that like some that. i like that that's that's yeah it's a it's, yeah. a it's a it's a good time saturday morning for most people um on the basis that some of these uh, people in careers they may not be able to get time off their their bosses or whatever you know <laughs> have them nose to the grindstone, not working all day long or something. And so, they, so this sort of stuff can be done in your own time at the weekend. So uh, posted a link uh, to access it. Uh, follow Keith on LinkedIn. Great guy, very experienced. And, and I, I just love what Keith does because he does like we try to do. He gives a lot back to the profession. Um, he's got a lot of experience. Um, he won't mind me saying, like me, he's got a few miles on the clock and he's happy to share with lots of other people. So check out Keith's masterclass program starting this coming Saturday morning. Great Back stuff. You, as Nicholas. you were talking, and I was listening to you as well, but I was at, I'm actually registering for that event. So Keith, I should be, I should be going to your event on the 19th of October at 10 30 in the Saturday, morning. Yeah. Great Not stuff. Great stuff. Okay. Um, We've done, yes, you've done your bit on the budget, Carl, and your appearance your, your, as a media mogul. So back to me. So Morningstar is gradually becoming more and more an, an impressive brand. It's, more, it's always been known for the fund, the fund analytics and all that kind of stuff and its, um, its portfolio software. But it's, sort of, it's, it's, it's getting more, it's putting out more good content around the behavioral stuff. And Christine Benz is the lady who works for Morningstar. Uh, I can't remember her exact title, but she's like a content. She's director of content for Morningstar, and there's a very good article in it about uh, in on, on online um, in which Christine Benz is talking about the bucket approach and her discussions with advisors in the U.S. about whether you're better off having buckets. You know, so the, the classic thing where you have two years worth of withdrawals in, in short traded bonds or cash and the rest of your money invested, or you just have a diversified portfolio, like a 60, 40 or 80, 20, and just roll with the punches. Um, and, you know, depending on how you slice and which time period you look at, you know, the 60, 40 can, can look appealing. But again, of course, in 2022, it didn't look at all appealing because, because bonds of nearly all durations fell through the floor. Um, and Christine Benz's view is the bucket approach works. And this is what I found really interesting. It's nothing to do with the maths. The bucket approach works because according to her research with U.S. advisors, clients get it. They just understand the simplicity of the bucket approach. They know that if when the markets have a temporary decline within their portfolio, they, there, there is whatever, you know, two to three to four years worth of withdrawals, not living expenses, but withdrawals. And I'll just clarify that in a minute. And they know, therefore, that cruise next year is going to happen. They know that they can put the grandchildren through university for the next three years, regardless of what happens to the markets. And it helps people stick to the plan. So that was my key takeaway from reading the article, that the bucket approach, anything that helps our clients stick to the plan is a good thing, right? And the bucket approach is so simple. And so to me, it's always been intuitive. It makes sense. Um, and it helps people do the right thing. Uh, just to clarify my point there, I often hit, when you read these articles, they often say, well, you, should, you have a bucket to cover two years worth of living expenses. No, you don't. That's not right at all. You have two years, you have a bucket to cover however many years of expected income payments from that wrapper. If a client's got a living expense, say they've got a living expense of 60K a year, that'll be coming from various different sources. One of state pensions, maybe a bit of DB stuff, maybe they've got rental property, and you might have a personal pension invested. But that, 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 that pot, that cash pot, it's just for the shortfall in their overall expenses. It's not two years worth of living expenses. I think that makes a massive difference um, to how much you're going to set aside. So a good, a good article there. Any thoughts on that, folks? Should we move on? Uh, Christine Benz has just come out with a new book. Though if you've seen it, probably a couple of you have. How to Retire, uh, 20 Lessons for a Happy, Successful and Wealthy Retirement. I've not yet read it, but I've heard good things from people that have. So um, I'm sure it'll be a culture corner at some point down the line. But yeah, she's um, also written a book. J just okay. back to I guess your... you got the book, Andy. No, I've, I've, I've heard good things oh, okay. about it, though. Right. Okay. Nick, good Nick just... Sorry, go on. Just, Sorry, just back to your, your point... Um, I shared with you, <clears throat> I won't mention it, uh, his name at this stage, but w there was a message I got from uh, um, a trappist, trap listener um, on LinkedIn the other day 
talking about exactly this, this idea of, you know, buckets and or allocating funds and or cash, I, th I think, um, without going into detail. I got the same he, message. It must have been from the same chat. Yeah. Yeah. But his, uh, he, the firm that he works for, as he said, seem to be attempting to defy science. But in their, their approach, they, they outsource to discretionary managers and they've got this whole kind of retirement strat income optimizing strategy blah blah and he was looking for just a, 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 a bit of uh, a bit of feedback and guidance and the only thing i could really say to Smooth him returns. is back to the the oft repeated statement on this podcast that it's an art as well as a science and whether it's buckets blended mm -hmm. portfolios or whatever it is not the spreadsheet doesn't decide the spreadsheet or the calculator or whatever can give you a framework but this is the real value of the of the financial planning the experienced financial planner to be able to know the client situation and exactly as you were saying nick to understand all the other sources of income guaranteed and otherwise they've got and create this artistic blend that resolves it but i do like that point that behaviorally clients get the bucket approach they can they can understand mm. that quite quite clearly it's a good point that christine makes yeah indeed okay uh ultra well it's morning stars show at the moment this is the third morning star <laughs> link this one is called, Why Do Clients Think Advisors Are Valuable? Uh, again, they've done quite a few extensive studies on this. The four main things uh, investors value in advisors, here they are. Advice I can rely on. Obviously, that's a very wide remit, I suppose. Helps me achieve my financial goals. Keeps me on track. And the fourth one I'm going to talk about is maximize, maximizes my returns. Again, uh, I think quite a few advisors shy away from this returns uh, issue. I'm proud that, you know, I, I want to get the best returns for my clients, create wealth. Wealth is freedom. Freedom is opportunity. Um, I know we don't want them to over-focus on that, and the other things are more important, the portfolio funds, the financial plan, what do you want to do, what's the reason behind the money. But getting a good return for your clients compared to all the other guff that's out there, I'm, I've got no problem with it. Um, but they also, yeah, so they speak quite extensively about, uh, you know, what, uh, investors value in the advisors that they work with so again it's in the show notes and they've got a quite a nice little visual for it as well that sort of maps out all the different moving parts any questions no i i, no? I think that's a really well made point and i've mentioned it a good few times before um you know if that's what the investors if that's what our clients want then you know you've got to be talking to them about exactly that topic. So I think a uh, really well-made point and good to yeah, have some, some people, supporting evidence. Yeah. Cause some people get so into lifestyle financial planning that they just sort of poo poo the investment thing and said, just put that aside. That's easy. We'll sort that out later on, but you do need to make it front and center. Um, at guilty certain as, times during guilt, the client relationship. A hundred percent guilty as charged. And um, it was our client advisory panel who said to us <laughs> or said directly to me, Stop doing that. You need to talk about the investments. So yeah, it's a really well made point. Mm. Just just following up, cool. interesting. That, interesting. Just following up on that a little bit, uh, Andy. Um, often we'll partially a lot of people I think uh, who embrace the evidence based investing approach sort of shy away from it a bit and just talk about capturing market returns and speak a bit less about investment, trying to you know beat the market and what have you. But, and again, it's maybe the subject of a, for another conversation later on in, a, in more detail. But if you sort of track that through, I mean, it's what I, I get a lot of, it, you know, when you get negative feedback about anything you might post online, et cetera, is, but why would I accept beneath market returns as guaranteed um, in terms of, you know, track an index, you're just going to get the index return minus the costs. But the maths, when you work it out, determines that if you buy an in an index type fund, low cost index fund, over the long term, they tend to pretty much always end up in the top quartile of all investment funds, which kind of goes against you, your initial thoughts or understanding. The reason for that is because all the other active funds buying and selling and trading will drop out. So probably over 10 years plus, a, a typical Vanguard style fund ends up as being a top quartile fund. And so you can begin to create a very uh, Alan, strong he, narrative. Al Alan is it's even stronger than that. The further you drag the time frame up, the higher up the rankings they become. Right. If you dragged it out of 100 years, index funds beat everybody. They're not mm. top quartile. They're top one. So, yeah, over a 10-year period, they might be quartile. 20-year period, they're in the top five. 30, they're in the top two. Like, yeah, the, yeah. the longer you drag that time period out, 
the higher they climb up the rankings. Which, which, pure math, pure math. Yeah, exactly. Which is which is totally relevant. But then if you talk to your clients, like talking to your clients about 30-year returns or even 20-year returns, you've lost yeah, But, uh, sure. but I think you could, you, you, could make, sure. you could make a good case. If, if, if your clients aren't prepared to invest for a decade, then they're, they're not the right type of clients. This is always multi-decade no, decade, investing. I think is, I think is re- but, uh, but I think you, yeah. could, you, you could be making a strong case for – another thing is this is highly predictable. Your ability to select the fund, the the active fund that will be top top even top quartile in ten years. Good luck with that. You've got little or no chance. There is there is no evidence of consistency of our performance of the very of the one year the top quarter of a one year. Highly unlikely to be the same fund top quarter after ten. Whereas an Sup- index yeah. fund will will end up there. Will be yeah. top. So to, to say, I'm t- you, superior so, returns. Yeah, superior returns of index fund and asset class investing is inevitable. It's just the time frame. You know, is sometimes yeah. hard for clients I'm, I'm, to I'm grasp. just saying, would, would the, be correct in saying you're investing for 30, 40, 50, 60 years? It's going to your kids, your grandkids, but sometimes they don't want to hear that. So we have to yeah. play a short term game. But but again, we're not. Well, shorter term. Short term. You don't have to. I'm just, I think I'm making a point that don't accept when you get pushback either from clients or from anyone else out there, you're just going to get sub market returns. Well, you're going to get above, just put above average. Or, you know, it'd be interesting to see the yeah. mass and what the data says. I haven't seen it in terms of what is what is above average returns and what time period. It's probably as short as five years, maybe even less. So above average returns compared to the market and then top quartile returns when you push it further out. So in other words, you make a strong case for having excellent investment returns compared with all your other peers and all the other players in the marketplace. Compared so you can be more, more, neighbors, proactive, yeah. more proactive and positive about the investment uh, strategy that you deploy as opposed to just saying yeah. you're guaranteed to get yeah. mediocre returns. And, and then here's, here's the other thing. Everyone else that gets involved in uh, terrible investments that blow up, that don't have any returns, massive high fees, you know, we're comparing ourselves to the most purest returns ever, like an index with no costs. You know, we're stressed that we're 0.751% dragging against the index long term. And then there's sharks out there that are just, you know, giving zero returns on terrible you know, portfolios uh, and investment funds. So sometimes we, we beat ourselves up, but we're still, um, you know, providing you know decent returns compared to, you know. Yeah, the, uh, the FCA the should crooks. change its warning, shouldn't it? Should, should say short-term past performance is no guarantee of future returns. Yes. Um, because long-term performance repeats, repeats, repeats. Okay, um, and while the buttons are tearing their hair out, Keith and Josh, we will get the correct spelling of your brand. Boost is spelt Bravo... October, October, Sierra, Sierra, Tango. Two Oscar, S's. Nick. Oscar. Oscar, thank you. That was it. Okay, let's crack on. <laughs> We're getting, what are we at? Jesus wept, 42 minutes. Right, Smithy, advise a conflict of interest with no link to anything. Uh, yeah, well, this is an interesting one, wasn't it? We talked about this. So uh, the trap mm. pack, particularly myself, and my learned colleague, Mr. Andrew Hart, were front page news <laughs> last week in, uh, in our trade magazine, New Model Advisor, Citywire, New Model Advisor. Uh, and the story was uh, around potential conflicts of interest and uh, the backtracking that public information. They've, they've, they've written about this before. Um, Andy and I are investors in Timeline which obviously is a piece of software for advisors, also runs investment portfolios, model portfolios for advisors. And, you know, the, the press, um, as is their want, uh, saw an angle there and thought, well, hang on a minute and refer to us as gurus, if only they knew. Um, and uh, here we go. Gurus, Jesus! Right, so so when on, on, on down that particular track, that you know we are people who influence. And to be fair, there was not one but two, you know, mentions and links to the Trap Podcast, and say, you know, a lot of people listen to the Trap Podcast. Um, do you feel you've got a conflict of interest? So I I spoke uh, with a journalist. She was really good, very fair. I think in the end, I think overall it ended up being a fairly balanced article, but it did throw up lots of other interesting conversations. Then they do refer to them. Um, uh, in this article, uh, you guys will remember when platforms such as Transact and Nucleus were early days. A lot of advisors who adopted them. Some, I think, were gifted shares. Not, I wouldn't 
I'm not not necessarily gospel. Some certainly were given the opportunity to buy shares at launch or at a, at a sort of discounted price. And so this whole aspect of are there conflicts of interest? If you've got if you've actually got your own personal money invested in something, a platform, a service, a, a, a company that you actually use and you speak highly of it publicly, you know, is that an issue? Um, there was one commentator, Anthony Morrow, I think his name is. Um, don't have the article in front of me. He said it. He summed it up to me really, really well. I said we've got bigger things to worry about when you've got consolidators who build their in-house discretionary service to take a margin on that portfolio. Um, there's there's more conflicts of interest there. Some of these very large organizations that build their in-house models that you know the rest of the independent market would never ever use. But it was an interesting one. I think overall it was. Fair. Um, Andy, you were mentioned a couple of times in detail. <laughs> what are your thoughts on conflict of interest as they apply to you being a serial yeah, angel investor, to... of course? <laughs> hospital to... pass. Accept that hospital trying to pass. Drag me into this. Um, no, I did read the article. I mean, it's been something that's been bubbling for a couple of weeks. Um, I'm very aware of the conflicts of interest and I need to give it the respect it deserves. Um, you know, integrity is the only thing we got in this thing of ours. Um, but I don't really have anything further to add. Uh, I mean, I work with lots of various different companies. I use lots of various different companies. My lawyer um, has advised it, me not to say anything it's a further. Line, it's a line that I uh, I need to straddle. Um, but I think the article is very fair, actually. Um, she did mention the 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 the, the beast of uh, conflicts of interest, which, as you say, was the. Uh, launching of the platforms, those transactor nucleus, where um, but they had to disclose that to their clients, so that was dealt with in in the correct way. And I'm again knowing the situation from the inside, um, it, it, they weren't swayed by having a shareholding. They still wanted to offer a decent service for their firm and their clients. But again, uh, I, I can understand that there's a conflict there. So nothing further to add. Carl, over to you, my friend. <laughs> I don't have anything to add other than. I was mentioned in the article, I have no such conflicts of interest at all. To be fair to you guys, right? I, I like the the shareholding is teeny tiny. I don't think there's a conflict of interest. Uh, but I think it is worth saying that, you know, in, as you just said, Andy, integrity is all we've got. So should we shy away from, from such articles? Absolutely not. I think it's totally okay. And I thought, um, as Alan said earlier on, I thought the article was very balanced to be fair and very well researched to be fair so and it was yes, it was a I'll huge uh, huge promotion of trap as well which is what was not intended but um we'll take that i'm sure we'll get a few more listeners from it in a, in a weird kind of way i, th I think one of the one of the things was um just the, uh, to me anyway this is where this whole thing first bubbled up you'll be you'll remember um one of the biggest podcasters in the world, Stephen Bartlett, he got into trouble with Advertising Standards Authority because turns out, I didn't know this, but he is a, you know, not a 0.03%, but a 20%, I believe, shareholder in Huel. He also sits on the board of directors yeah. of, of Huel. And is it Zoe? One of the other things that he, and he advertises them, you know, every week on his podcast without disclosing. And so that is a bit naughty probably to say that this is wonderful. It's a great product. I use it myself. Oh, by the way, what you don't know is I own 20% of the company and I'm a, a you know, yeah, person I, I of listen, influence. I, I listen, I listen mm. to his podcast all the time. Like, and, and I was under no illusion whatsoever that <laughs> yeah. he was involved with those companies. I think only someone who's very naive would think that he'd be doing that just out of the goodness of his heart. But anyway, well, they um, might they might have yeah, been look, it's, they it's, might have been paying for it. They might have been paying for advertising, not that he actually owned a huge chunk of it, which is somewhat yeah, different. Okay. So, so maybe that's where the whole sort of story began to bubble up, and then they look for other other angles. There, there are, yeah, there, there's, there, it's hard to avoid conflicts of interest in in life in general. But mm. I think if you're aware of them, at least if you do what's necessary, if you if you're prepared to disclose them. Where it, it, it um, where it appears, where it's relevant. You no, know, um, the journalist was Vicky Bell, and she did a great job. She's a, she's a great journalist, actually. And as you say, she took quite a while to put that article together. She did mention it to me before she published it. Um, so that's what we want, more honest journalism. Um, and because I think there's a fair more stories that they could, if they start digging deep, could find uh, across our sector should they choose to. So, um, But it was good, as you say, great advertisement <laughs> yeah. for this podcast. Careful yep. now. Yep. Well done. Well done. It's nice to nice to see that. Very nice to see that. And I'm a 
you know, I'm a pretty vocal critic, critic of the legacy media, but that's a, that's a shining example of it done well. Okay, the final topical tip bit. Oh, ultra. Oh, this is back to me. Uh, we spoke about cash management services the other day, and I can't believe I've not come across this before, but HL, Hargreaves Lansdowne, the biggest DIY platform in the UK, I think, uh, they've got this awesome offering uh, called Active Savings, and they've got 10 billion quid already in it. Um, it's cash management, basically. They pull the money between a whole host of different banks, like loads of them. Uh, so they, they're doing all the you know, the plumbing and the heavy lifting in the back end. Their easy access at the moment is 4.6. That's pretty awesome. Six months, 4.85. One year, 4.7. Um, so I think a lot more platforms are going to be getting on this bandwagon because cash now is not useless. Um, and it's paying about, you know, four and a half, five percent. So we're going to see a lot more innovation in this space. Mm. Um, so I think this is an example of cash management uh, pulled against, uh, sorry, the money's pulled yeah, uh, across. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm having a look at the website. It's, yeah. Uh, it, it's it really is, innovation. Is this a bit, is this a bit yeah, like uh, the Flagstone they're, other they're models? They're basically competing directly with Flagstone. Oh, and, I didn't know uh, that. Insignius, the ones that we know. Yeah. Yeah, see our latest rates, how it works, all the, all, the, all the banks that they use. Like, it's think and being hl i think the tech will be awesome yeah um, yeah it'll be slick as anything you'll be able to move money between as anything you, you yeah decide the i bank think and then i think right. this is theirs for the taking if they get this right yeah i agree um so yeah quite interesting innovation um any questions carl i don't think you've seen this in ireland quite yet this type of pooling no, of money but, and cash and... no but we need it um badly yeah i'll <laughs> I'll talk about I'll talk about that probably in in our end the meat and potatoes because it's uh, hmm. yeah this Q Q, Q Carl's bi-weekly rant about the state of the art bank. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, I I I had two articles in the topical tidbits and I said I'm taking them out. I'm just going to be positive, Carl. Today there's going to be no fraud, no scandals, nothing for me today. Oh, I love it. You're not going to upset okay. anyone, right? So Trappist, thank. We're at um fifty fifty two minutes, so I think we can. We can move on to the meat and potatoes of episode 55. And this is based around a LinkedIn post that Storyteller put out in the last uh, week or so in which he referenced a Financial Times article about basically just the lack, the lack of interaction between the British public and and the great companies of the UK, the, the apathy around investing, the ignorance and the misconceptions that so many of Joe Public seem to hold, and which, if anything, have got worse over the last 30 years since we had that privatisation boom of the sort of 1980s and the Tell Sig campaign. Anyway, sorry to that. I don't want to take away all your thunder. Talk to us. Um, thanks. Yeah, this, this was originally, I looked at the uh, Financial Times at the weekend, and despite, I think, our common misgivings about what we call the legacy press, I do think the FT does put up, particularly in the personal finance section and particularly in the weekend FT, does put up some pretty good articles and some decent journalism. And they reported uh, a number of, I think, I was going to say startling facts. I think we all inherently know this stuff, but when you see it written in, I was going to say black and white, in pink and black, um, it, is, uh, it's, it, it, is, it is quite eye-opening. I'll just quote a number of, of the stats that they refer to. UK savers have over $430 billion held in cash amounts, so nearly, nearly half a trillion in cash just in the UK alone. Three million people have more than 20,000 in cash ISAs. 8.6 million have more than 10,000 in cash deposit accounts. When asked why, 20% were worried about losing money. 25% believe that investing ah. is too complicated. Um, only 23% of correct. people in the UK invest at all in the stock market. So less than a quarter less invest in the stock market versus 61% in the US. And about half of people believe that financial advice is only for the wealthy. So look, I know that keeping cash uh, cash balance is healthy and having rainy day money and emergency money is really important. But when you look at this data, I mean, one of the other um, stats that, it, that I think this actually came from the FCA, which was, was the original source, that all of these people with the billions and billions um, kept on cash deposits, at least half of them, based on the FCA's interpretation of the data when they've surveyed people, could afford to invest those in, in the markets. Um, they quote something else. Now, they quoted the um, just the, the past 
past historical returns. A £1,000 investment in the iShares 100, so the, the FTSE basically, which hasn't exactly been a stellar FTSE, performer yeah. in the last decade. But even £1,000 invested in the FTSE <laughs> 10 years ago would now be worth £1,851 compared to £1,137 generated by the average cash ISA. Not quite double, but heading towards that in a decade. And that's just compared mm. with the FTSE 100, which had you compared to maybe a global equity market would be significantly different. So as I titled that um, LinkedIn post, it's that slow motion wealth destruction in real time. There's a fundamental issue at heart in the UK. I think it was a few people from Ireland also commented, Carl, to say it's exactly the same over here. Um, and I'm just, uh, I, I thought it was a good point because this is the stuff we all try to do. We try to educate our clients. We try to sort of translate this information and, and explain that it's not about risk and there's a different set of risks that you are exposing yourself to if you keep high cash balances. But seeing those numbers was actually quite startling and the post got a lot of engagement from other people. So who yeah. wants to go next in terms of your actual thoughts on on the subject? I, I'll go just to, to kind of segue in and the, the, the Irish experience is even worse, Alan, I would say, because um, at least there were some kind of deposit returns uh, coming via the, the UK cash accounts, whereas here um, the pillar banks were, you know, giving the, the pillar banks being Bank of Ireland and AIB. Um, all the other banks left, so we're left with those two and permanent TSB, um, and they basically were not giving any returns at all, to the extent that their latest profit numbers that they announced during the summer, they admitted that basically, yes, we have some term deposit rates, but people aren't transferring over to them. So you have this general apathy to sorry, actually Carl, go and do stuff. Yeah. Because they were giving zero returns, you know, incentives drive behaviour, did that not then have a knock-on effect to people saying, well, I'm getting bugger all return on my cash. What else can I do? Oh, is this thing called the stock market I'm going to invest? Or did it have, like, no impact? I would say zero impact, and that's proven in the numbers. So the amount that, on That's quite telling. Worked. Even when it's, it's most extreme, there's no change in behaviour. So, yeah. yeah, hence we have a fundamental problem, yeah. Yeah, so there's there's a couple of reasons for that, right? Number one is um, you guys have no idea what the financial crisis did to Ireland, right? And we were just all loaded up with masses and masses and masses of debt. So there has been a massive cultural shift that if we have a financial crisis or recessions or whatever coming down, we're going to be in much better shape because yeah. people have gone, mm, don't think that debt thing, you know, it's it's very recent history there's a number of people in business who were affected by it and will never make the mistakes again me included so um i i think that that's one one of the reasons for it and then another reason is well okay i can access better returns uh, in cash so i'll get onto the investing piece in a sec but i can via european banks because we're all part of the eu right but Jesus, if I haven't heard of the bank, if I don't know the name of the bank, I'm not going to do it. So that that's kind of led to the money just sitting there. But I, I think um, we have a long road to go to educate people in terms of investing and investing for the long term. And I, I know my kids are interested in this, but they do not do anything about it in school at all, at all, at all. So this goes back to the curriculums at school, first and foremost. And, and try and generate. And I know, Alan, you've spoken about, you know, talking to your kids about, well, what do you use? You use, you know, you have an Apple iPhone. So let, why don't we invest in Apple? And stuff yeah. like that is really, really good to get engagement and to look at kind of investing in, in over the long term. And of course, we have this massive problem here that the younger folks can't get on the property ladder. So if we can, you know, start this culture of investing as opposed to the culture of saving, well, then that, but we need to take a very long term view on this, right? That's a 10, 15, 20 years down the line. We would, of course, you know, see the, the, the fruits of the labor in terms of the education if we could get people to invest. We don't have, uh, you, you mentioned uh, Elisa earlier on, Andy. I never actually heard of that, but, you know, we have nothing like that. But we did before. It was called the SSIA. You put in 200 quid and the government topped it up by 25%. That's exactly it, yeah. The whole country had an SSIA. Now, you could have an investing one or you could have a cash one. But I think the vast majority were investing ones. I was a 
a broker consultant for an insurance company back in those days. And I was literally going around with wheelbarrows, like saying, yeah, load them up there. Let's go. And I and it did help people, but it was for a, a particular period of time. And then it stopped and we didn't go back. Probably financial crisis kind of put an end to a lot of that potentially reoccurring. But now when we're awash with money and the banks have so much money in uh, on deposit, like we're talking, I, I would say the per, per, per head numbers are higher here in terms of cash being held. That This is the time now to strike and this is the time to introduce it. And I had advocated for something like this a couple of times pre-budget. Um, <laughs> it didn't get much traction uh, because these are longer term measures. But this is the kind of stuff that we need to introduce. And, um, you know, I, I hearing about the, the Hargreaves Lansdowne uh, cash management tool, etc. These are the kind of innovations that we need. And unfortunately, the big problem we have here is if there's very little innovation and very little competition, well, there's not much incentive for the the people who are here at the moment to make any changes because they're making shed loads of money. Um, the pillar banks, just call it yep. straight, they're, they're making absolutely tons and tons of money in terms of profits um, by not encouraging anybody to do anything at all. So... Um, yeah, we've lots to do. Obviously, the exit tax that we spoke about earlier on, that's also a big problem. Um, so I think there's there's really quick wins to have a really serious long-term impact and make this a better country for everybody in the long term. Okay, I'll uh, throw in a couple of uh, points. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts of this. Uh, financial education is a, is a real issue. Uh, but the thing is, financial information is abundant now. Um, you know, YouTube, podcasts, blogs, there's more than enough information. People are just not interested in it. People just don't care about money investing. They find it just too boring. Most people, those who are interested yep. in it, there's loads of information they can find out about it. And the people that do find out about it and they find out about investing, you know, they do get rich slowly. Um, the interesting thing, auto enrollment for pensions, I think, has had a superb impact in the UK. So most people by default now become investors the moment they get their first job. Uh, and auto enrollment um, builds up wealth very slowly in the background, and over time, people become more and more interested in this thing called their pension. Um, you said about twenty three percent of the people in the UK invest in the stock market, Alan. Well, if they're investing in auto enrollment, which must be more than twenty three percent of adults, that doesn't quite make sense. Uh, again, that's just people I, I think self selecting that, probably... that they invest in the stock market yeah, or don't. Yeah, I think that excludes auto enrollment. Okay, he's directly investing in the stock market outside of a pension. Um, yeah, all right, yeah, not 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 too much more to to add. Um, as I say, if people are interested in this stuff, there's more than enough information for them to get their teeth into. Be it podcasts, be it YouTube, be it blogs, be it books. Um, the point about investing uh, financial advice for the wealthy, I'm sort of in agreement with that. Um, the ongoing fees for financial advice is typically around fifteen hundred, two thousand pounds a year. So you need to have a certain amount of wealth to fall into that bucket. I know there are different services that are a bit more light touch, a bit more subscription based, but again, they struggle to scale as we've spoken about a lot in the UK. Sorry, as we've spoken about a lot on this uh, podcast. Nick, any final thoughts on uh, this subject? Yeah, it's it's an ongoing tragedy, isn't it? I mean, I think, Alan, you said the slow motion wealth destruction. I think that'll be the title of this episode 55. Just, I'm just scrolling down the comments under your LinkedIn article, Storyteller, um, and... Um, because Carl, you mentioned it's not taught in schools, this kind of stuff. And absolutely, it should be. Uh, but a couple of points there. I mean, this is not knocking the entire profession, but teachers are not generally the most financially, they're not interested in it particularly. They've, they've got defined benefit pensions. So it's, it's, I don't think it's front of mind for them. And this Ian Batterby, Batterby said in the comment, I did some work with the Personal Finance Society last year delivering sessions in schools. I gave up after one school kept counselling on me and kept pushing out the dates. I think it was three times in the end. It was hard work trying to speak to the schools and trying to get something booked in. It's really not on top of their list of things to do, even when it's well-intentioned and well-qualified volunteers are given their time free. They, they, I couldn't convince them it was worth doing, which is a real bloody tragedy. Yeah. The, the, whole, the whole thing is this thing that we always talk about. It's this, this, this perception of, it's this confusion of risk with volatility. You know, and the, and the volatile markets yeah. means you're going to see yourself wiped out. Therefore, we'll, everything stems from that. 
and we'll, we'll mm. stay in cash because it's safe. And this 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 misunderstanding of how terrible inflation is, how that's the real risk to, to people's real wealth in terms of purchasing power, which is all that money is, is purchasing power, right? And if it loses its purchasing power, you might have a million quid in the bank, but if it can't buy you jack shit, it is worthless. Um, and it just stems from that. How we crack it, I do not know. Um, and, and the fact that, you know, in the 1980s, we had the, the, all the private, I, I don't think you had the same thing in, the, in, in Ireland, Carl, but, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but in the UK, we had all these privatizations, the, the Tell Sid campaign for BT. I still remember the adverts, they were that good. Um, and, and we did have lots, large numbers of people going into I'm the stock market. I'm way too now, young to know what you're talking about. I was going to say, you were, you, were you alive? The, uh, you were alive in those days. Can you expand for the younger listeners, Nick, what this campaign was about? You were, it was privatized in 85, Andrew, so you were four years no, old. I'm surprised I was, I that was you... far too young for this. Exp- explain what happened. Uh, well, the, uh, the the nationalised companies such as British Telecom, British Gas and so forth were sold off, were sold back to the public um, and at discounts, marked discounts to what the likely profits were going to be in the uh, in the real yeah. world and, and the, the, Thatcher's government. And there were loads, there were just advertising campaigns probably run by Saatchi and Saatchi who did the uh, mm. brilliant uh, Conservative um, parliamentary electoral campaigns in the 80s and, and people just got in, people just got hooked on it and they did it. Same with the so banks. Sorry, you know, how, how, did, how did you that that qualify, knows. Nick? Did, did I just write off a subscription or write a check? Yeah, you just wrote a Yeah, Anyone could have bought anyone. shares. There were, it was, I remember it, Nick. It was just... So lots it was, of families all loaded up, did they? Yep. It was yeah, blanket yeah, advertising. Two, you, you know, got two a huge discount. In it, you know. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. And it was a thing, you know, and it really was... I've seen some um, stats. I can't remember the numbers, but had you have done that, that uh, and invested in the in the newly privatised British Gas that I saw, and they've had various what are they it morphed into Centrica and there was a whole stock splits and stuff. But, yeah, yeah. You know, a hundred quid invested in that would be worth quite a few thousand. You know, twenty thousand or something. Don't quote me on that, but a lot, in other words, relative to what you might have done elsewhere. And I think that's that's the point. And I, I did put that in the uh, in the piece as well. I mean, maybe maybe just there isn't incentives enough for, from government. But underlying this is there are social issues there. The, around In the UK, Ireland, and around the world, there's an increasing them and us. You know, the, the, the super rich get richer and richer. If you own assets, uh, proper assets, property and, and equities, uh, inflation is less, has less of an impact on you. It doesn't have zero impact, but has less of an impact. And they tend to be, you know, the wealthier people, that's how they own their assets. And the rest of the people tend to do what we're talking about here. They may own their property, but they want to keep safe in a very cash. They keep money in cash. So that they focus gap, on currency. Yeah. Well, that gap widens. That gap widens over time. So, you know, you, could, you can imagine that just, you know, more and more kind of social unrest, them and us, um, dissatisfaction. And so there, I, I do think there is almost, there's a, there's a strong argument from a, from a government to, uh, to run another or a series of other kind of like the the marketing campaigns they did all those years ago, which brought so many people who had never invested in shares before in their life into being shareholders and, and, and equity owners and owners of businesses and companies. And in, in doing so, by allocating a small amount, by explaining to the mass population the difference the, between risk and short-term volatility, that if you are able to allocate, but, and I'm talking about 100 quid a month or something into savings plans allocated to, to equities, over the next 10, 20, 30 years, you're most likely to do better off. And explaining yeah, it and articulating have, it. Hmm? But they don't know themselves. You can have one one uh, one area of the government saying invest, it's amazing, you're going to create wealth. And then you're going to get a person down, that, down the hallway saying your capital's at risk and you're going to lose all your money. And they're going, oh, yeah. hold up, what's going on here? We're trying to promote it in the uh, in, in Just, the, yeah. just, in just the to underline this, just to underline this, and this is not a political point, it's just a fact. And, and the, the previous administration were awful as well. There's not a single member of the cabinet that's ever worked in the, in the private sector. They, uh, so they're at the top of our government and wow. they've never worked in the private sector. So it, 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 it's, it's like talking double dutch to them. They wouldn't have a clue. And it's interesting, uh, in, in the article that you've quoted, Alan, if, if mm. they did mention... Uh, a comparison of investing in a hundred percent UK equities versus cash, yeah. And then if we put a client in hundred percent UK equities, they'd have kittens. And it's like, okay, well, you're using that as a proxy. Well, that's just anyway, that's just an FT yeah. article to give you a comparison of what you might have. Um, let's have a look at what you could have won. Um, and I, I think yeah. that's the. Under, I, th- I think you make the point well, Nick. Um, because, and again, as I also mentioned, you know, if you, you, you can point fingers at who's to blame. 
there's this, and I'm not, we don't have the time or energy to go into this because it comes up so regularly, but it's this huge, you know, monstrous compliance industry, regulatory industry yeah. that just misses the effing point on the whole thing that just does not understand this and continues to smash it down. Even experienced qualified professionals and tells advisors up and down the country, you know, your clients are cautious investors, but you know, give them cash and bonds because they're cautious. It's just, it's, it's heartbreaking when you see this, all we can do us for, and, and through our, our influence and speaking to other advisors is try to educate. You're not going to flip a switch and change people overnight, but if we can just make an impact and so that some other advisor sitting somewhere can have a healthy, positive conversation with their client and articulate the difference between short-term volatility, long-term security, biggest risk is running out of money, biggest risk is erosion of your wealth, then we've done a good job. Obviously, wishful thinking for me to hope that any government, let alone this one, would embark upon some sort of education for the masses. Not going to happen. They need, so they need to change the risk warning. They need to change the risk, risk warning on the stock market. The risk in the stock market is not being in it. Yep. Yep. Okay, we're at 70 minutes. I mean, so I think the conclusion, and I'll just quickly finish on this as well, my final comment on this. The real tragedy is that compared to the 1980s, it's never been easier or cheaper to own the great companies of the world. It's just sitting there. A few basically clicks free. away, really. It's basically you know? free. It, Basically, for the 1980s, there were sharks left, right, and center, and the charges were prohibitive on, on savings contracts. And now it's just there, and, and, and we're not touching it. I think we all recognize we, the problem, and none of us have a solution. And I, I just can't see it not ever being the case, certainly in our professional, the, the span of our professional lives. Okay, let's move on to the uh, next uh, section of the show, because I can see Posty hauling the bulging sack of Trappist questions up my driveway. If you want to leave a question for one or all of the Trap Pack to answer, please do so. You can find a link in the pinned tweet at Advisor Podcast. Also, there's a recurring link in the so-called show notes. Um, and we will get to your questions. We do them in chronological order. Not an easy word for someone with a brain my size to say. And we will come to yours in good, in good time. But let's see whose question we are answering today. Uh, very nice envelope, quality manila, and nice cartridge paper as well. This is from Adam. Now I'm going to butcher your surname, Elal, E W L L U L, Elal, Adam Elal, um, and your LinkedIn profile is on there as well. So we'll put that in the so-called show notes. Okay, this is Adam speaking now. <clears throat> Background: I'm a 21 year old, just started my progression towards becoming a qualified financial advisor. So forgive me if this is a stupid question. No, nope, no questions are stupid. When you guys use Voyant cash flow modelling. Do you consider the risks of potential tax rate increases in the future and the knock-on effects it would have in regards to the plan as a whole? Um, I, I know Ultra will have a thought on this. I will quickly go first. No, I mean, we, you know, in terms of the tax allowances within Voyant or with any cash flow software, hopefully, you, could, you have scope to say how much they go up by each year. And I generally say half the rate of inflation. But in terms of actually building in plans because CGT might go through the roof or inheritance tax might be this or pension tax-free cash might be that, Absolutely not. You would dri you'll drive yourself insane, Adam. You can only plan with what we know to be the facts today. You have to make assumptions going forward. And back to the art and science thing, most of what we do really is really informed in assumptions, but it really informed guesswork. But it's, that's as good as it gets. It's, it's, it's informed yeah. guesswork. So no, do not build plans around what how might happen to tax and so forth, um, because you're going you're gonna to drive yourself, do lally. You're not going to help the clients. You're adding no value. Ultra. I think you've nailed it, Nick, but it is quite an interesting question, Nick. The amount of hours that we've discussed Voyant in rooms with other advisors, the this issue's not really been raised that frequently, has it? Uh, I'm like you. I escalate my tax bans in the future uh, below inflation, so I'm being harsher to my clients, giving them less net money, um, so I'm being cautious from that point of view. But I don't, for example, if I believe, let's just say, for example, thought experiment CDT was going to double in 10 years' time. I don't factor that into the model. Firstly, because the system can't do it. <laughs> and well, secondly, yeah. <laughs> back to your point, Nick, uh, I'll just be guessing out, at, you know, guessing blind. Um, so, no, don't overthink it. Um, use what Voyant set. Any of the known tax changes are set in Voyant. The escalation rate in the advanced settings, just do it a little bit less than your inflation rate, and then you're being cautious to your clients but it is a good question it, it doesn't come up that much with advisors discussing it um 
unless Carl and Alan have got anything else to add? No, I, I just say it is a good question. Um, and Adam, at 21, to be uh, delving into the, 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 the weeds on Voyant like that is superb, my friend. Uh, keep doing what you're doing. Keep trying to learn it as best as you possibly can. And a superb career is ahead of you. All I would say great is... Stuff, great stuff. Just for the record. Hang on. Hang on. Yeah, go on. Go on. So he's, yeah, he's, put a nice to, he's put a knife to a gunfight, this guy, isn't he? <laughs> uh, first of all, other <laughs> cash flow modeling software tools do exist. Other than Voyant. I'm sure Voyant's very good. Uh, other tools. Um, but again, we, it, we have kind of vaguely talked about this in the past in that there are so many variables that could change. Tax mm -hmm. is only one of them. Health, I often think, is another one. Um, God forbid, divorce and multiple other things could happen to the or, you know, <laughs> var variables will will inevitably happen. The the plan that you agree, Nick Lincoln often says this, the plan agreed, one thing for certain, it will be out of date almost the minute the meeting is over, uh, is the point. The, the, the plan is designed as a map of the terrain. It's not a guarantee way this is how things will work out. But it's better to be approximately right than totally wrong or to be without any guidance or map at all. So good question, Adam. Wish you all the best Abs of luck for your future Ab career. Absolutely. Yeah. The planning trumps the plan. And and just to just to just to clarify, as we have mentioned Voyant a few times, I don't have any shares in Voyant. I can't comment upon Mr. Hart's position or Mr. Widget's position. <laughs> but I have no shares. Ah, okay, just a that's minute. Uh, okay. That's another subject. Neither do I, just for anybody <laughs> that might be interested out there. What's what's the journalist's name, Alan, just to clarify things? I Victoria Bell, I think. Victoria, okay. I don't own shares in Voyant either. <laughs> right, <laughs> let's crack on with the final segment of the show, which is, of course, Culture Corner. And I'm going to go first on this one. So my one, it's not really, it's not related to this thing of ours, but it is around money, and it's a fascinating tale, and it's, it's, it's a short offer duration. So the book Casino by Nicholas Pileggi is on sale um, on Kindle for 99p. It was made into a fabulous film in the mid-1990s with uh, Robert De Niro Joe and Pesci. Joe Pesci and an absolutely sizzling Sharon Stone. Um, and it's a really good... I read it years ago and lost the physical book, so I'm going to get that on Casino. Nicholas Pileggi is also the guy who wrote Goodfellas, which became the film of the same name as well. So, uh, you know, that he, he, he... And the... the Goodfellas might be my favourite film, but the book is almost as good as the film. Um, and Casino, the book, will be as good as Casino. So, 99p, get it. Fascinating read into a world long gone, um, focused around money and casinos and the skim and so forth. So, it should be of interest to people who are involved in this thing of ours. Of course, this thing of ours is shorthand for the mafia. Um, so, I'm getting myself into a hole here. Right, let's move on to the next one. That's me, Nicholas. Uh, and oh. I would like to recommend the Mel Robbins podcast and a particular, the latest episode, which is Billionaire Life Hacks. Um, I just, I really like this podcast. She uh, is very upbeat. Uh, she's very positive and they're short and sharp, these episodes. She goes through kind of life hacks from billionaires that she talks about, Warren Buffett, Taylor Swift, LeBron James. It's really good. Nick, you'd, I don't think you'd enjoy it. I think, this will be marmite for people. I just enjoy hey, this. Who's, 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 LeBron, who's LeBron Swift? <laughs> uh, moving swiftly along. Who's next, Nicholas? <laughs> Have you got oh, any to share, Carl? Any good life hacks? Or have got to listen to the podcast? Uh, it's very short. Like, I mean, the Warren Buffett's one is read, read, read. Taylor Swift's is, you know, sing, taking sing, notes sing. along the way. Dance, dance, LeBron dance. James is uh, sleep, <laughs> sleep, sleep. Shoot, shoot, shoot. So, um, oh yeah, no, it's... Well, we don't need to listen to it now. There's nothing that we don't already know. No, but there's nothing Eat that we food, don't already no know. No new it's ideas. Free there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's not one for you, Nick. Yeah. Okay, I just stand by, ready yeah. to tear apart Andy's. <laughs> <Can> <laughs> I... <laughs> Oh, mine's mine's uh, very intellectual, above your station, mate. Uh, um, right, Ikea wardrobes, yeah. is it? No, 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 no. <laughs> so mine is the Chris Williamson podcast. Again, uh, Derek Sivers, um, who set up CD Baby, sold it. It's quite a good thinker. It's called The Unstoppable Power of Reframing, Reframing Your Experiences, a couple of hours long. And I'm going to finally mention it's totally unrelated to uh, this thing of ours, but Monsters on Netflix, I finished it at uh, the weekend. It's a pretty brutal 
series. Um, so yeah, check that out as well. Is that the Menendez brothers? Menendez one? brothers, yeah. Oof, it's brutal. Whoa. Brutal. I've, I'm three episodes in. That it is brutal, scary, and yeah, horrible. yeah, yeah. It's not. It's not. Yeah. Uh, what was that? Yeah. What, what was that other series that your father recommended, Carl? That you, you, we shouldn't watch. I couldn't remember why we shouldn't watch it. it? <laughs> it's, on, it's on Apple TV, no. apparently. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Move okay. along. Alan, Move over along. to you. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and it, Derek Sivers is fabulous. If you've, um, I've read, I haven't, I haven't heard that podcast, but previous stuff that he's done, he's just. It's quite yeah. new. Quite new. Yeah, do, do, you, don't, you don't like it? It's I thought it'd be up your street, Nick. Derek Sivers. He's very kind of understated. No, I saw very... listening to it. He's one of these guys who no one ever challenges him. He just talks and he says things. I'm thinking, well, push back. It's just, it's, yeah. it's like a lot of it's bullshit, I think. Sorry. There you go. <clears throat> okay. 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 Um my suggestion this time round is a podcast called Business Made Simple. Originally, um this whole thing was set up was the guy called Donald Miller. I don't know if anyone's come across Donald Miller. He's got this whole again, it could be conversation from another time. This whole kind of podcast and book and series called uh, Story Brand, Building Your Story Brand. This is an offshoot from this. Business Made book, Simple yeah. podcast. So it's not specifically related to this thing of ours, financial planning, but it's, it is related to anyone running a small business. And it's very focused on marketing and growing your business. And the podcast uh, that they had, the interview recently, was a guy called Marcus Sheridan. Now, I read Marcus Sheridan's book quite some time ago. One of the real mm, like innovators it. on content creation um, wrote a book close, some years ago called friend of mine. That They Ask, You Answer. And of course, obviously, he's appearing and he's, he's doing the podcast circuit because he's got the latest, an updated version of it, which incorporates all new technologies and AI, etc. But it's it's a thirty minute uh, listen or or watch, and really good. You know, half a dozen practical ideas that you can implement uh, in terms of you know growing your business, uh, marketing, and innovation. So, link as always you in the show can you notes. Share one idea like Carl did. I, no, I'm going to leave you to. Uh, Who put to you in to charge? <laughs> Well, I tell you, I tell you the what the one idea is, and I'm going to leave this because you probably know it already, Andy. But he talks about the big five. Get into the big five. You want to, if you want to create content, write about the big five or make a video about the big five, and it's nothing to do with going in safari. Boom, boom. Right. Let's do this. Finish it. Okay. On that. On that. On that. Um, <laughs> Cryptic ending. On that note, um, I think we have reached a wrap for this episode. Eighty-two minutes in, we're still friends, just about. So, thank you, dear Trappists, for um, for your time and, and for your input on the show. Do rate us, leave a review on um, iTunes or however you do it in the, in the Apple in the Apple in the Apple world. That'll be great. Six out of five stars. Like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We seriously are not that far now from a thousand subscribers, which still blows my mind, really. Um, but so until the next time from the Trap Pack, it is adios. Take care out there, folks, and we will see you in a couple of weeks' time. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Descended into chaos. <laughs> that was all right. That was good. <laughs>